There's a poem that I um, sent out in the uh, update, and uh, you probably read it, but let me read it for you. It's short. It's called uh, Autobiography in Five Chapters. Many of you have heard this before, but it's really good. Chapter one. I walk down the street, and there's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find my way out. Chapter 2. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't even see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place. Amen? Amen. So we've, all, we've all experienced that, probably. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. But my eyes are open and I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down another street. <laughs> See, chapter 5 is good so that's called growth that's called getting off the carousel and it's called stepping up and so what I want to do today is share uh, it's kind of a continuation of last week so you might want to get that CD from last week because I think I give 4 or 5 points in there uh, but I want to give 4 or 5 points today and those ideas are ideas to help us get off the carousel uh, ideas to help us I'm not really into New Year's resolutions, but setting intentions and, and resolving how life is going to transform and be different. Well, these ideas, I think, can help. They've helped me, and so I, I think I'm not so different, so maybe they would help you as well. And the first one I mentioned briefly, but I want to mention it again. And that is, whatever you're doing in your life, you don't want to build it on fear. You know, when you're going to make a job decision, don't do it out of fear. And most of the time we do. When you're going to do this or that, uh, we're dealing with some kind of relationship issue, don't do it with fear. Fear must not be your motivation. I'm going to suggest love and confidence be our motivation in whatever we happen to be doing. And I gave you the example last week. I want to give it again because it's one of my favorites because I've used this. 90% of heart surgery patients do not change their habits in any significant way. How many of you were um, here last week? Okay, so you go around, so about half. So, so, you know, good to tell the story again. From those studies, we learn what does work and what does not work. 1993, Dr. Dean Ornish started a program, and he had, it was going to be a medical trial to last one year, he had 333 people with clogged arteries, and all the uh, doctors were saying these people need to have open heart surgery now. And so these people signed up to do this. Um, most of the pain, and all of them were having heart pain, most of the pain, the angina stopped within four, five, six weeks with all of the individuals. So that's amazing. Three years after this, the study was only a year, three years later, 75% of the people were still following the program. Now, see, that's, that's usually different because the history of all this is that people just do not change. These people changed and continued to change. And so in the study, Ornish, what he did was rejected the traditional approach. Uh, doctors normally motivated people by saying, you're going to die, brother. <laughs> You better quit doing this. And uh, it just did not inspire people. And most of these people just thought, well, you know, I'm going to die anyway. And so nothing changed at all. 
So Ornish changed the whole deal of motivating people by saying, as I said last week, look, you can have a good life. You can be slim again, you can be strong again, and you can be making love again. And so that got their attention, and these people changed. And so what do we learn from that? I mean, we could look at lots of studies, but this study is a good one. What do we learn? We learn that hope inspires change. So if you're planning on changing anything in your life deliberately, do it from the perspective of hope. Do it from the perspective of love. Do it from the perspective of confidence and not because you're afraid. That's number one. Number two. Number two is really brief, but it's really important. And uh, what I'll say is, if you want to change something, you've got to track your growth. In some way, you've got to track it. In some way, you need to do something physically. Somebody said, what you measure matters. If you don't measure it, change will not stay. Now, that's what I found in my life. I am I'm an expert on change because I was such a mess to begin with. And so I know how to change. And this is an important idea. When you measure your progress, scientific studies tell us that you raise the likelihood of um, uh, continued change by 30, 40, sometimes 50%. So that's what you want to do. And you want it to be daily. Weekly is pretty good. But you want it to be daily. And you can do it in many, many different ways. And I'll give you an example or two. Uh, you know, many of you participated in the stone ceremony, the white stone ceremony. And I suggested you move that stone every single day. You see, that's a ritual. That's a way to measure what you're doing. You have a, a concept on the stone, and you don't want to just put it away. You don't want to just put it somewhere so you can see it. You want to actually touch it. Touch it. You want to feel it. Touch it. Move it. And, and you may have seven places each uh, for a week, and you, you put it in those places. And then you do it again. And then you do it again. You want to have something like that. I, I often use shells. Uh, you can write. Journaling is a great way to do this. Putting down your ideas and seeing how you progress. But in some way, if you want to change something and you want it to continue and not just last a couple weeks, you've got to measure that progress. Don't go crazy with it, but spend a moment or two measuring it. Number three. This is a, good, kind of a cool trick, I think. This is a little shamanic, maybe, but I would suggest that you use time to your advantage. Time is something that you can play with. Uh, you know, we can shift into the future, we can shift into the past, and all the time be in the now moment. And so use time to your advantage. Jane Austen, I read this quote some time ago, and I thought it was so funny. Uh, I just liked it. She said, oh, exclamation point. Do not attack me with your watch. A watch is always too fast or it's too slow for me. I cannot be dictated to by a watch. Rising above time just a bit. Uh, I read different topics. A few years ago, I was really interested in time management, so I was reading a lot about time management. And, you know, when I do that, I get a lot of books and read a lot of books. And so I was reading, and this uh, man who was a friend of mine, but also a very successful man in business, he came in and he saw my, you know, seven or eight books there on time management. He picked one up and just tossed it in the trash. And he said, this is your biggest waste of time right now. <laughs> and I thought, now that is a very different idea. Because all these books are telling me I couldn't live without them. Uh, in the mid-90s, I was working with the Chamber of Commerce. And I was introduced to Edward Deming. Any of you know him? Mm-hmm. Great, great quality control expert. I mean, um, an amazing person. This is what he said. If you focus on time management, you'll miss what's really important in your life. Guaranteed. You can get so busy being planned by your planner, writing everything down and afraid and, afraid and guilty when you don't, worried about the clock and not about what truly makes a difference in your life. Uh, you master the minutia and miss life along the way. He said your most important moments come during day-to-day -day humdrum, during an evening walk, during a conversation. He said it's called serendipity. 
And so time, how we handle time, is important. Here's the shamanic idea. A guy, the guy I mentioned last week, Robert Cooper, in his book, Get Out of Your Own Way, mm -hmm. talked a little bit about this. But it's called time compression. And what that means is you place yourself in a, in a, in a good mood. You place yourself in a good state. That state means you would proclaim all things are possible for me. You know how to get into that. Maybe you play music. Maybe you meditate. Many ways to do it, but you get into that state. And then secondly, you compress your timeline. You say, well, you know, I need to do this in a year. And so you say, I'm going to change that. And you take the timeline and compress it and say, I'm going to do this in one month. Or if you have something you're going to work on for five years, you take that and compress it and say, I'm going to do this in five months. And so you compress it and then you ask this question, how can I do this? And you're in that powerful state. People who do this find the most amazing ideas just begin to come to you. So whenever you feel something compelling, deeply compelling about your future, you can do this, and you know, from a scientific perspective, you can look at it scientifically or spiritually. From a scientific perspective, and I don't understand what all this means, but I, I, I believe it's true. When you do it, your brain, your uh, hippocampus is activated. They do this, they know this from studies. And your uh, frontal cortex, stimulated. And your sacred memory begins to be activated. And so you have those three things happening in your brain. But you may not care about what's happening in the brain. What you're really doing is setting yourself up so spirit flows through you. A, a, a Native American would say what's happening is you're becoming a hollow bone. Now maybe things are happening in your brain that makes that possible. I don't really care how it's happening. It could be happening in my big toe. I don't really care. But either way, I'm becoming open. And things are just flowing through me. And I rise above the mundane. I rise above the little day-to-day -day emergencies. And I see something much bigger than that. Compressing your timeline will give you clarity. If you've been walking around saying to people, I just need some clarity. And, and what are you dealing with? I'm dealing with, with a five-year period. But when you compress it into five months... Everything changes. I mean, the feeling you have changes all about it. And you begin to use resources that you didn't even know you had. And you have a new energy with the whole process. So you have to place yourself in that positive state. And then you do that. And it equips you to do the impossible. You begin to say, this is what I want to do. It's impossible. And you do it just like that. How do you do it? Playing with time. Don't let time be in charge of you. Don't attack me with your watches, she said. Because you're above time. Number four. Doing okay so far? Mm -hmm. Coming pretty fast, pretty good. Number four is imagine. I'm sure you've seen it. I, I saw the sign a long time ago. It said, uh, um, imagine world peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that one? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's another one. Imagine world peace. I prefer world peace. World peace don't really appeal to me. <laughs> so let's do that. Let's just take take a minute and do that. Can you imagine world peace? Close your eyes. And just imagine that for a moment. World peace. Imagine the world. And imagine all the strife that is just about everywhere. Maybe you'll be drawn to a certain part of the globe. Maybe you'll see the entire globe. And then see peace descending upon everything. And take a breath as I ask you, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And so you create that peace. And then just let it stay there for a moment. Let it rest.
and you can open your eyes. You know, I was uh, looking at some of you. Some of you are really pretty. Some of you are really beautiful. Handsome. All of you, I suppose. Every face I saw was. Some of you were smiling when you were imagining world peace. Some of you were looking very peaceful as you did that. What if we could get every leader in every country to do that? To imagine, close their eyes and imagine world peace. And to begin to speak peace. Begin to think peace. Begin to reach out for peace. Begin to visualize it. Everybody. And, you know, they, we could even do advertisements for peace. We could do jingles, chants for peace. Could that happen in the world? Maybe. Maybe, but we'd have to have a collective plan. And we'd have to know how to hold on to it. And we certainly would have to imagine. Because if you don't imagine the miracle, the miracle probably is not going to happen. Um, it'd be a lot of work, though. It's, it's not easy to change our thoughts. It's not easy to change our fears. But it begins with imagination. But, I think, you have to be at a certain developmental stage before you can even imagine peace with confidence. Some people just can't do it. I, I remember, you know, I was raised in a, a volatile environment, I suppose. And, um, you know, a friend of mine was killed beside me. I mean, like, beside me. And I was under 10. Very traumatic. A few things like that happened. Years later, I was having some pain in my neck. I was at Duke, and doing biofeedback. And I was doing pretty well. And, you know, one person was in another room, and I was doing this, and had this light, and I was slowing the light down, and all of a sudden it really started flashing, and uh, the, the person said, what happened? I said, I just can't find peace. Because I was in the mountains, and it was peaceful, but then someone was coming from behind. So he said, try again. So then I went to the beach. Peaceful. Sun. Waves. But still there was that fear. Now many of you may not understand that. If you've been in war, if you've been in certain situations, you understand it. Or in dysfunctional families, possibly. I can feel peace in my life now. But I think you have to reach a certain stage of life before you can be confident enough to say, I could imagine peace everywhere. Because some of us can only imagine war and violence everywhere. So I'm encouraging us to imagine something more beautiful. Imagine something higher. Reaching up. Blossom like a flower. Flow like a river. And reach and rise like a tree. I read that years ago. It's from Zen. But that's good. Imagine. Imagination is so powerful. Intention. Imagination. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And as you do that, you create a scenario. Imagine it. You create the scenario. Create two or three. Look at them and then select the preferred scenario. And move into it so deeply that you're already so thankful for it. And you can feel it. You're captured by the cause. That's good. It's a good time to do it, I think, this time of the year. If there's a job you dislike, do that. Imagine what it would be. 
an important thing. Wayne Dyer wrote a book about intention. And in that book, he said there's seven faces to intention. Because he sees intention not as willpower. He sees it as a, as a spiritual force in our lives. Intention. It's alive. And it had, has these uh, seven faces like um, receptivity, love, beauty, abundance. It has those faces. Seven words. Everything you do when you begin to create your new job, when you create your new partner, when you create your new health situation, everything you do will fit in those seven words. You don't want anything out of those seven words. You want to operate with those seven faces, with those seven filters, with those seven aspects. You can check his book out. Uh, I think it's called Intention Something. But by doing that, it gives you tremendous power because it's one thing to image something but it's another to gather the energy in and the power in so you can activate it and it become real. And you can really do that, and that's part of change. It's living in such a beautiful space. It's absolutely amazing. I, I, I was thinking about this uh, last night, and, and I uh, thought, well, I think I'll read the Bible. I don't always do that, but last night I did. It was Genesis chapter 11. Now, this is a place where most people wouldn't even think of looking. But this is something that goes way back in my memory. And there's something here that is absolutely amazing. It's about imagination. As a community, you see, we, we want to imagine things. You want to imagine things. Imagination is one of your greatest gifts. Listen to what this says. Now, it, this is just a story, but tucked in there is this one verse, this one statement. It says this, you know, this is a myth, but it has truth. Now, the whole world had one language and common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled down. And they said to each other, hey, come, let's make brick and bake them. And so they used brick instead of stone. And they said, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches into the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. The Lord came down to see their city and the tower that they were building. And then the Lord said, anytime in the Bible metaphysically that it says, the Lord said, what it means metaphysically is this is a spiritual principle about to be uttered. You could even say the law said it. Uh, the uh, principle says. So this is what it says. If as one people speaking the same language so you have one people one identity like with us. We are one people. All of us are divinity. Okay. I understand that. Secondly, we speak the same language. And so when we speak, we speak blessing. I talk to, I'll say something to Carol, and Carol says, blessings. Kathy, blessings. Tom, blessing. And, and we're operating within the seven faces of the picture. We're blessing. That's powerful. One people, all of us are divine. Same language, same purpose, clarity. Okay. If as one people speaking the same language, these people have begun to do this, then nothing will be impossible for them. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible to them. Why? Because they're one people, same language, and they began to do. So you've got identity, you've got purpose, but then you've got to have action. You can lay on your couch and imagine all kinds of beautiful things and nothing's going to happen. You've got to get up and do something. It takes inspired action. Is that all right? Mm. Let's see. Uh, let me think for a second because I've got... Uh, what else do I want to tell you today? I had a thing or two to tell you about action. So let me just um, 
say this, and then I'm going to close. A man went to a mountain, and he took a spoon, and he picked up some snow. And he came all the way back and put it in his empty well. Then he went and got some more snow. Put it in his empty well. He did that all day. And then the next day he started again. And the next day he started again. And finally, in the well he had water. That's how you build your dream. Action. Piece by piece. Action, piece by piece. In Kentucky, a long time ago, they were building a, a, well, actually, they had built one well, and they had to fill the other well up so children wouldn't fall in. And so they were filling it up with sand, and they were using a mule, and they were, the mule was dragging this cart over, and they were dumping it all in. Rodina remembers this. Um, <laughs> And so they were dumping all, you know, dumping all that and filling that well. It was very important to get done because you never know when a child is going to fall in. And uh, the donkey was, um, uh, was not bright. And he fell into the well. And they tried everything in the world to get it out. And the donkey was crying, wailing in the well. And he was saying, and he sounded like Eddie Murphy. And he was saying, <laughs> help me. Did you see, what show was it? Eddie Murphy was it? Had me Shrek. Okay. Had me Shrek, okay. man. So there he is. And then finally, they, they, the Kentucky men are chewing their tobacco and they say, Well, hell, we can't get him out. Let's just cover the poor soul up. And so they just started dumping you know, more and more sand down in there. And, and pretty soon, he stopped crying. It's sad, isn't it? Not a sound. And one of them said, look what he's doing. And they all gathered and looked down in the well. And what he was doing is the sand would come down, he would shake it off and step up. That's exactly what you have to do. No matter what happens, you shake it off and you step up. Shake it off, step up. You've got to take action. You've got to take action. Let me ask you this. If everybody behaved like you, listen up. If everybody acted just like you, what kind of family would they have? Small. <laughs> if everybody acted just like you, what would, what would the job look like? if everybody acted just like you. Let me ask you this. We have a community here. What would this community be if everybody acted just like you? What would it really be? Because, you know, we're supposed to live in such a way where we're really making that kind of, that kind of a difference. Uh, one line in The Man of La Mancha, Don, Don Quixote, uh, one line is where he, he says, take a deep breath of life and then choose how you're going to use it. And that's what I would urge you to do. Take a deep breath of life and decide how you are going to use it. You are a magnificent creator. And that's no lie. That's the absolute truth. And anything that's distracting you, just let that go. And you know what you do? You shake it off and you step up. You're smart enough to do that, aren't you? The donkey figured it out. And he got out, he grinned at the Kentucky man and said, how do you like me now? Thank you.